Thanks for joining us as we continue our series in the book of 1 John, a series we call Testing Your Faith, helping you discern where you really stand in relationship with God. One of the challenges or disappointments we face as a church is when we see people seemingly embrace a relationship with Jesus Christ and grow leaps and bounds in a very short period of time but then just as quickly seem to fall away from Jesus and, and, and walk away from the church, his family. You know, this is a reality that Jesus warned us about, uh, saying this type of stuff happens when he told a parable of the four soils. And some of you may remember that parable. It starts off talking about how a farmer goes out and spreads the seed, and the first seed lands on the hardened path, and it just doesn't sink in. And then the birds come and eat the seed and it flies away. There's no growth. The second was, a, was the soil was, was rocky, and as the seeds landed in the soil, there was enough of soil there that it sprouted up. But when the sun came out, the, uh, there wasn't enough depth of roots. There wasn't enough water, and so the, the plant just shriveled up and died. The third soil was a soil that seemed good, and the, the, the plant sprouted up suddenly, but also weeds grew up. And the weeds weren't taken out, and as a result, the weeds start choking out the life out of the plant, and it just died and, and, and faded away and didn't bear fruit. And then the fourth soil was the good soil that produced a, a phenomenal plant that produced uh, seeds multiple times over. And what Jesus was saying, this is, describes the spiritual life of people. Some people, they're just hardened, and they don't respond to the gospel at all. They're, they're just not interested, and it just sort of bounces off. But then some people will respond quickly, but because there isn't either the depth of rooting there, that when persecution or troubles come, they, they, they just fall away. Or for the others, when weeds grow up, the weeds just choke out the spiritual vitality. There's stuff in their life that they allow to grow up in their, uh, parallel to their spiritual life, but it's competing and it's fighting for their attention and for their energy and their focus. And as a result, their spiritual life dies and withers. You know, when people sort of fall away from Jesus and fall away from his church, it can be for a whole variety of reasons. But sometimes people just, when they fall away from Jesus, it can be rooted in different fears or insecurities, a, a relationship tensions. Um, it could be their work and the busyness of life, or it can just be what they truly value and prior prioritize in their life above Jesus. But at the core of it, at the core of every one of these issues is, is a spiritual root issue of a distorted view of Jesus. That if they truly understood who Jesus was and who Jesus is, then they wouldn't turn away from him. They wouldn't chase after these other things. And, and, and so what they're ultimately saying is as they think about Jesus, is that there's something insufficient about Jesus. That Jesus isn't really enough. And so our attention does get diverted away to other things and we start chasing other things because I don't truly believe I can get full life through Jesus alone. Yeah, I maybe need Jesus plus something else. And so people, for whatever reasons, they turn their attention away from Jesus and they head off in a different direction. And as a result, they also walk away from his family, um, the, the group of community that he's established to be there to help them grow. They, they walk away from that as well. So how can you be sure that you're not one of these ones that will fall away, will walk away from Jesus? And that's what John is writing here. He's giving us these, this series of tests to help us understand where are we really at in relationship with Jesus? And so in the first week, we talked about the obedience test. Well, do I actually obey Jesus? Because every time I disobey Jesus, I'm again distrusting Jesus. And am I going to learn to trust Jesus and just simply do what he tells me to do, understanding that he loves me and he has my best interests in mind? And then Pastor Steve talked last week about the, the love test or the family test. Do I actually love the family of God? If this is truly the family that God is building and he loves it and he died for the church, am I willing to do the same? Am I willing to let go of my selfish desires in order to serve you? And that's what Jesus is calling us to. And so John says, that's a test. Do you actually really love the people of God 
Or you say, I love Jesus, but, but I don't love his church. Well, as Steve said, you can't say that. Because if God loves his church and God is in you, then you got to love his church. It's not that you got to, you will love his church. And so it's one of the tests. Are you actively practicing love for, for his family? But what we want to get into today is John's third test, what I call the perseverance test. So listen to what John says here in John chapter 2, verse 18. He writes this, Dear children, the last hour is here. In other words, the end times, we are in the end times. It's taking a long time to end the end times, but we're in the end times. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming. And already many such antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. I posted an ad on Facebook for um, Strategic Discipleship, the, the website where, where I host free discipleship curriculum and, and other resources for people, for churches. So, so I created this web ad, or the, this Facebook ad, put it up there. It was only up there for seven days. But I was amazed at the amount of comments that I got that were, were attacking Jesus or attacking the church. It was such that I had to go on every single day and delete all the, the offensive memes or the comments about the church. And, and uh, I had to monitor it very closely. Actually, several times a day, I had to keep going in and removing um, very offensive types of comments. Well, John goes on in chapter 2, verse 19, and he's talking about sort of these anti-Christ or anti-church people. He says, these people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left it, uh, when they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. So what John is saying, these actually these anti-Christ people, though, aren't just out there in the community. The anti-Christ people he's worried about are the people that are in the church and, uh, and influencing the teaching of the church. They still proclaim Jesus. The problem was they minimized or distorted his identity uh, to the rest of the church. So Jesus was, um, in and of himself, was not sufficient in their minds. He was never intended to be in their minds. Jesus was simply a man that either the Spirit of God came into, or he wasn't even a physical man. He just had the appearance of a man. Um, but that Jesus was not God himself. That Jesus merely showed us how that we could become free of, of the trappings of our mortal body and attain, attain true spirituality. And so... Whenever you make Jesus out to be something less than who he is, that's always a problem. It distorts reality. It distorts the truth about the person and identity of Jesus. And, and what it also does is it elevates your view of self. If you're going to limit Jesus or distort Jesus, you are going to raise up yourself because you can become sufficient without Jesus. You can become adequate without Jesus. You are essentially more than Jesus. Jesus was just a model for you, an example, but really you can rise up yourself and, and, and you don't really need Jesus. And so what happens is a pride can start to set in uh, because you are more than you really are in your own minds. Uh, these false teachers in the church, they were proud. They were proud because they had the truth. Uh, this whole uh, philosophy of Gnosticism was rooted in this knowledge. Gnosti uh, Gnosis is knowledge. And because they had the special spiritual knowledge that they got either from the angels or through the Spirit of God, or however they claimed to have get the special enlightenment, that raised them up above all the other believers. And so it created this pride, it created this disunity, this um, division within the church of the special spiritual super Christians and the uh, lowly unenlightened Christians. One of the things that uh, was interesting about the comments that I received in this Facebook ad was they kept stressing, a lot of them, how unenlightened Christians were. 
we are still trapped in the dark ages. We still bought into all these lies and this mythology. And as a result, uh, we live distorted lies. But they were the enlightened ones because they've risen above that and they had a better picture of reality, a better picture of truth. And so as a result, they just mocked relentlessly the church. They mocked relentlessly anyone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus. And there was a, a deeply rooted pride that was expressed through all these comments, all these posts. So the question is, what do we do with this? Well, we got to understand that maybe in some ways we do the same thing too. And we got to be aware of that and we, we got to start watching for it. Is there some ways that we actually minimize or distort the identity of Jesus? And I think that whenever we focus on something other than Jesus to meet our needs, to give us that sense of joy and peace and sense of fulfillment, whenever we're trying to get that from something other than Jesus, you've minimized Jesus. You've, you've said Jesus isn't enough. And, and so you need to, to become aware of when am I actually feeling I need something? I must have something to be complete apart from Jesus. Uh, starting to tune into that. Whenever we get distracted, either by work or by sports or by anything else, well, once again, we diminish Jesus because we say, that's more exciting, that's more important, that's a higher priority in my life. I must attribute more attention to that than I do to Jesus. Why? Because that ultimately counts more. That, that's more significant. That's more important. I've got to focus on that. I don't have to focus on Jesus. Jesus is always there. But right now, this has to be a priority in my life. Well, whenever we do that, once again, we diminish Jesus. If we avoid church, we actually diminish the value and the priority that Jesus already established for the church. This is the church he died for. This is the church he's creating. This is the church he says he's building. This is the church he's saying he's leading. This is the church that he's given gifts to. This is the church that he's leading into eternity with him. It, it's all about the church. It's never about a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's always about the family of God in God's mind and in his purposes and his intent. He always works through the church, the gathered together believers, never individual believers off by themselves. It's always through the gathered together believers that send out individual believers into the world, but it's always through the church. The gospel and the, the writings of Paul and the apostles, it's always about the church. Whenever we become anxious or fearful, hmm, have you been anxious about anything during the, these days of COVID? Your job, your health, uh, anything like that. It, does anxiety set in? Does a fear set in? Does it control you? Well, again, we're diminishing the person of Jesus, who is the life giver, who is the healer. Who Now, that doesn't mean we don't use wisdom and common sense, that we don't uh, safeguard against a virus. But the question is, am I fearful? Because fear it, it comes into play. We're, we'll talk more about this whole issue of anxiety and fear. Whenever we strive to prove ourselves, again, we're diminishing Jesus. Because again, it's a pride thing. I need to achieve. I need to accomplish. Well, no, Jesus has already accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished. He just calls us now to enjoy him and to journey with him. We don't have to prove anything. We don't have to achieve or strive or measure up in any way. He's taken care of all of that. And yet, we get so trapped into that. Do you get easily offended? <laughs> if people criticize you, I mean, we're all guilty of that, right? We all do it because, once again, we're defending who we are. Well, we don't have to do that in Jesus. If we understand who Jesus is and what he's accomplished for us and what he's given us, you know what? There's nothing to get offended about. People can say whatever they want to say. People can do whatever they want to do. You're still okay in Jesus. And so all these things are ways that we start to realize we actually minimize and distort the identity of Jesus too. And, uh, and so we want to be on guard about this and we want to persevere. Fortunately, in John's day, uh, these false teachers, these antichrist teachers, they left the church. They, they left and they, they walked away. And, um, and so then John goes on and he writes in, in chapter 2, verse 20. He says, but you are not like that. You're not like them. You're not like those people that walk away. 
for the Holy Spirit has given you his, or the Holy One has given you his spirit. And all of you know the truth. So I'm writing you, um, I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And so what Jesus is saying here is anyone that, or sorry, what John is saying here is anyone that doesn't acknowledge that Jesus is God in the flesh, God incarnate, God who came from his throne in heaven in physical form and lived on the earth and, and declaring that he is the Savior, the Christ. Anyone who doesn't acknowledge that, they are essentially anti-Christ. They're not acknowledging who Christ Jesus really is. And so the core issue is the identity of Jesus lived out in their lives. And, and John talks here about truth and lies. And, and understand that Ultimately, the truth and lies center on the identity of who Jesus is. Every counseling uh, issue that we deal with, uh, what, whatever it is on the surface level, whatever emotional trauma or relationship tension, whatever it is, any addiction, as you get down to the deeper core of that issue, it ultimately is rooted in, again, a distorted understanding of who God is and specifically who Jesus Christ is. Every time you're not experiencing the fruits of the Spirit in your life, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, etc. Again, there's some spiritual tension in your life that's not trusting the identity of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to work in and through you, that it creates a barrier to you experiencing the Holy Spirit's fruit in your life because you're not trusting Him. You're not trusting who He is. If you only understood who he fully was, you'd have no problem trusting him. You have no problem embracing him. I was once talking with a friend who was struggling with this whole um, surrendering to, to, to God thing, and he acknowledged that the big issue was a control issue. I'm not willing to let go of control. I said, well, yeah, that's true on the surface level, but actually at a deeper level, it's not really a control issue. Because if you understood that God loved you, God had an incredible purpose for you and God would equip and empower you for that purpose and that everything would turn out amazing in the end. If you truly believe that about who God is and what he could do in your life, you'd have no problem letting go of control. So even the control issue is rooted in a distorted understanding of who God is. So what we need to do is we need to correct your understanding of who God is so that you'll have the courage to let go of control and trust him and then let him do a radical work in your own life. But again, it, it's coming down to that trust of who he is. And so, so when John talks about acknowledging, acknowledging the Son, this isn't simply an intellectual, oh, I believe this. It's, it's saying, I understand that he, this is who he is, and as a result, I will surrender my life to him. So the acknowledgement isn't just an intellectual response, but a life response. I acknowledge Jesus, and therefore, I live my life in this way. Uh, trusting him each step. So John then continues in verse 24. He says, So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he has promised us. So what John is saying here is, Remain faithful to the gospel message about Jesus Christ. And if you can remain faithful to the message, and, and then you will remain in relationship with him. If you trust the message about who Jesus is and what he's done for you, then you can remain with him. And as you remain with him, you have fellowship with him, both with the Son and the Father. And, and that relationship then gives you life. He gives you life. His presence in you gives you life, and it's eternal life. And so John, or in Colossians, Paul writes this, in 1, to 23, Paul writes, He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. I've shared that verse in the first week. But he goes on and says, 
if you continue in your in the faith stable and steadfast not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven of which I Paul became a minister so Paul's saying like Jesus has come to make you holy blameless with uh, above reproach free from accusation he says that's what he, he he will do for you if and there is this if if you remain in him if you remain um, if you continue in the faith if you stay in fellowship with Jesus then that's what he does in your life and so how do you know where you really stand with God well both Paul and John are saying is by the fact that you persevere you know you have a relationship because right now you're persevering how do you know where you stand I'm persevering in Jesus and so they were saying, keep persevering, just so you always know where you stand. And this isn't really a theological issue about can you lose your salvation or not. That, that's not what they're trying to address in these, these passages. What they're saying is, you have assurance right now, if you are persevering and you are loving Jesus, you're loving the Father, and you're allowing his love to work in and through you to, to love others, and you're, you're, you're walking with Jesus daily. Well, then you have that assurance because you're persevering with him. So don't lose that assurance by, by not persevering and by walking away. Um, if you do walk away, then yes, you should start asking questions about where your heart really is. Like, what priority does Jesus really have? Who is Jesus really? And, and it's, sometimes when we get to that point where we walk away, it's because we've really had a distorted view of Jesus all along. Uh, it's, been a, it's been that shaky, uh, sort of rocky soil type of thing. Yeah, we can sprout and grow and feel great at the moment. But the problem is, yeah, it's, it's pretty rocky ground or it's, it's weedy ground. And that creates a problem. And so... I tell people, don't rely on something you said as a child, um, because uh, who knows where your heart is really at, what your understanding was, what you truly surrendered to. Uh, the test of where you stand is right now, where are you persevering? How are you persevering with Jesus right now? That, that's what you should be concerned about, is where are you at right now? And are you making a commitment to persevere and walk with Jesus and just enjoy him? Um, that's... That's, how you, that's one of the tests you can focus on at this moment. So John then continues in verse 26. I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches is true and it is not a lie. Well, this is an interesting passage. Uh, John saying, you don't need anyone to teach you. The Holy Spirit's just going to teach you everything. And so, how do we understand that? Well, the Holy Spirit here is, again, the context of the passage is all about affirming the identity of who Jesus is. That Jesus is God in the flesh who came down to earth and took on human form in order to die uh, the death on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And so, John or is writing here when he says, you don't need anyone to teach you. It doesn't mean that you don't need teachers in your life. Um, that would contradict other passages of scripture, such as uh, Colossians 1.28, uh, that says, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. Colossians 3. Paul writes, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Uh, Paul writes in, to 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders, of the, uh, the elders who rule well be considered of double, worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. You see, constantly throughout the New Testament, we're called to teach one another. Uh, that's one of our jobs is in discipling, is that we're constantly teaching each other, building each other up in Christ. So when John writes here, says, you don't need anyone to teach you. He's, 
he's not discounting all of this. Of course we need people to teach us. I can learn from you. You can learn from me. We can uh, reveal scripture to each other. We can explain scripture. That helps us understand it better. What John is saying here is that, that when it comes to the identity of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is going to affirm in the true authentic believer who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is going to affirm for you that Jesus is, is, is God, and it's his spirit that is in your life. The spirit is saying, yes, I'm the spirit of Christ, and I'm here within you, and I'm going to do a transforming work in you. I'm going to make you like me, and so the spirit of Christ, and I love that a lot of the New Testament passages uh, change it from the Holy Spirit to the spirit of Christ, because it's Christ's spirit that's actually indwelling you, and it is a spirit of holiness. It is a spirit of righteousness, but it's the spirit of Jesus himself. And so as what's the spirit of Jesus going to do in you? He's going to convict you about who Jesus is. And he's going to call you back to the teachings and the life of Jesus, encouraging um, you to let him live in and through your life. So what John's saying is you don't need special enlightenment. You don't need special uh, knowledge to get this relationship with the Jesus and this spiritual identity with Jesus. You simply need Jesus. And so John is, is, is writing saying, if someone's coming along and they're telling you, you need more than Jesus, well, they're then an antichrist. And we just don't see antichrists out in the world. We, we got to watch, is that antichrist teaching somehow seeping into our church? And if so, we need to be extremely careful. So yes, we can learn about others. Uh, learn from others. We can be taught by others. And what the Holy Spirit's going to do, he's going to take the teaching, scriptural teaching, he's just going to affirm it because yes, that's what Jesus says. So John then continues in verse 27. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. And so remaining in fellowship with Jesus is the key to eternal life with God. Remaining in fellowship. Uh, the, 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 the word here technically is abide or live in or continue in Jesus. Uh, I, I like the, the fellowship word, uh, remain in fellowship, because that, that accentuates the relationship dynamic. That we're to remain in relationship, enjoying Jesus in a personal way in our day-to-day -day lives. That, that I get to walk with Jesus. I get to talk with Jesus. I get to experience him working in and through me. That's really what Jesus wants to do. He, he wants to live his life in and through us, directing and empowering us so that we can accomplish everything we are created to be and accomplish. Um, and so the challenge then for us is can we say that, yeah, I'm actually daily walking with Jesus. I'm enjoying Jesus. Is, is that actually what I'm doing? Or am I getting distracted by the weeds? Am I getting distracted by the pressures and, and the busyness of life? Uh, do my days actually reflect the enjoyment of his presence? And, and, and unfortunately, we probably a lot of times we'd have to say, actually, no, my day reflects the frustration and the toil of life. And yet, can I actually sort of step back from that and just focus on enjoying him? Uh, our church, uh, we've been encouraging you to uh, go through this past week without complaining or grumbling. Uh, how's that working for you? And I encourage those of you who are watching now to continue that. Yeah, we did that a week ago, but let's, let's continue in that now. Because if you actually make a decision to stop complaining and grumbling, you can actually also make a decision to be thankful to Jesus for the life that he's giving you right now, regardless of what the circumstances are like. And you can just allow his joy and peace to flow through you. But as soon as you start grumbling and complaining, we, we shift away from that. We lose sight of who Jesus is. And we minimize him in, in some way. And so getting back to that parable that I started with about the four soils. Are there some weeds in your life that have grown up and are choking the spiritual vitality out of you? Are there some weeds that are being expressed through busyness? You just don't have enough time. You don't have enough energy because all these other things are sapping life from you. Well, the solution to weeds then is to, first of all, identify them. Because a lot of times, I don't think we even notice the weeds. We just think it's life. It's just 
what happens and we deal with life. But actually, Jesus is saying, no, actually some of those things around you are weeds and what you do with weeds is you pull them up, you uproot them and you cast them aside. And maybe there's some things going on in your life that you realize these things are actually interfering with me having a deeper walk with Jesus. It's keeping me from having a quiet time where I can just read his word and talk with him. It's keeping me from uh, focusing on what he wants to accomplish in his mission, in, in loving others, loving my neighbor, reaching out to others, sharing Jesus with others. What are all the things that are keeping me from doing that? Those are the weeds. And Jesus would say, well, why don't you rip up the weeds so that you can flourish more spiritually, grow more spiritually, and start bearing more fruit, spiritually speaking. If you don't pull up weeds, what you discover is that you no longer sense the presence of Jesus. You're on your own. You're by yourself. And as a result, your, your spiritual life is growing increasingly apathetic, lazy, bored, uneventful. And, um, and really, there, there's less fruit, less joy, less peace, less impact. Uh, people aren't coming to faith or, or growing in their understanding of God because you're in their life. Nothing's changing for them. You're not being light. You're not being so. These things happen when the weeds choke all that out. And so really part of the persevering journey is starting to uproot the stuff that's going to slow me down. And Paul says, throw off everything that hinders. Now, I love that. Throw it off. Everything that's slowing you down in your walk with Jesus. Just find a way to get rid of it and persevere with Jesus and focus on him and enjoy him. And so I really encourage you, get back into a daily walk with Jesus. And I just don't mean reading the Bible and a little prayer time to start your day. That's important, do that. But I mean throughout the day, make sure you practice the presence of Jesus in your life. Allow him to work in and through you. Allow him to love your neighbor, whoever your neighbor is at that moment. Allow him to love your neighbor through you and see what he wants to accomplish. So the tension in this passage is that people minimize Jesus and they fall away from him. They fall away from his church. The solution to make sure that you don't fall away is to abide in Christ. Remain faithful to him. Remain faithful to his teaching. And so what's the practical application, the action step? Well, are you able to identify at least one or two things in your life right now that are hindering you, slowing you down from your spiritual walk with Jesus, that are, are keeping you from enjoying him thoroughly, that are keeping you from uh, letting him work in and through you, that are keeping you from loving people around you, and that are keeping you from bearing fruit? Identify one or two of those weeds and make a decision right now saying, I'm going to uproot those. I'm going to throw off whatever's hindering. I'm going to cast them aside. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray that you help us to persevere. To do that, Lord, would you help us to identify how we minimize who you are, who Jesus is, and we focus on the wrong things. Help us to see those weeds that are growing up around us. Help us to go deeper into the soil and the root of your word. And Lord, I pray that this week you would help us to remove and throw off anything that hinders us so that we could more thoroughly enjoy your presence in our life. And as we journey with you in that way, may you bear much fruit through us. So thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us. Continue with us next week as we look at another test of your faith. Have a great day.